Hello and welcome to Conservation Commission meeting. Um, it is May 25th, 2022 at 7.04. Um, Jen, our chair is out today and our vice chair is also out for the time being. So we're just gonna go right to Dave for some <laughs> updates. As I lose my voice. How much time do you need me to take here, Aaron? Me and Dave, um, our hearings start at 7.30. So, you know, you've got a little bit of time today to... Um... Well, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do a few updates around town and then we can, um, you know, if there are questions, sometimes we just don't have much time for questions. So let's see, um, just a couple of updates for you from the field um, and again, Aaron and I, as best we can, try to get out in the field. We're coordinating with Brad and Tyler and a number of consultants. Um, let's see, starting with community gardens, you know, um, we are full at uh, Amethyst Brook. We only have 10 or 12 plots there. So those are uh, honestly all taken for the year. Stephanie Chicarello, our sustainability coordinator, is working with Brad, Tyler, myself, and Healthy, Healthy Hampshire. Um, to get Fort River Farm, the community gardens going there. Um, we're making progress, but we've got fencing to repair, new kiosks to put in, um, the raised beds are there, soil arrives. So, you know, we're, we're pushing it in terms of planting, but what we've said to any of the gardeners and Hampshire, healthy Hampshire has been great. What we've said to them is this is kind of a, a little bit of a sweat equity year. You may not get the full season at Fort River Farm because we're 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 building it as we go. We're flying the plane as we go, but um, but I think they understand that, and we have a number of people. I think there are twelve raised bed gardens and then twenty some odd plots. You know, in ground plots. And as I said, uh, compost was delivered today for the raised beds. Uh, we have we have a sandpoint well that has gone in already. This is um, Ryan Carb was nice enough to help us from Many Hands Farm. And this is a basically an old fashioned handheld pump. Um, and it's pretty cool. It's, I'm gonna say it's six to eight feet deep and we're gonna give it a try um, and see how that does this summer. There is a high water table um, at Fort River Farm. So we'll see how it goes. We're also preparing with Healthy Hampshire to maybe bring in a cistern and use a cistern there throughout uh, the you know the summer months July August um, September if it gets um, if it uh, as it often does gets dry so um, yeah we'll have we're hoping to have kind of a grand opening down there and of course we'll invite the commission and the council and I imagine that would take place in two and a half three weeks or so um, we're getting ready for the season at Puffer's Pond um, standard things there porta potties have arrived. Uh, new beach sand has been spread um, and we're beginning testing. I believe testing begins a week from Monday. So we did have that, you know, hot, um, hot weekend last weekend, I think it was in the 90s. And, you know, we had good, good use of Puffer Spawn, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't off the charts, which I was a little concerned about. Um, so Puffer Spawn is kind of gearing up. Um, I wish I had good news on coverage there, but I really don't. Um, I might have mentioned this before, but, you know, the pandemic years were so tough to get through for businesses and for municipalities and, and all of us. But it, was, it they were two great summers when we had a lot of staff whose offices and, and departments were not open. So we reassigned them at Buffer Spawn. And so we were really able to do a lot of meeting and greeting and 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 educating down at Puffers. And by all accounts, people loved having a presence there. So um, we are not gonna have that strong a presence there this year. We don't have those extra staff. And honestly, we're having trouble as many um, places are recruiting summer staff to work on the trails. So right now, I think we actually hired somebody and lost them uh, to another job that paid a few dollars more per hour. So I think right now we're probably at two field staff, seasonal field staff, plus Brad and Tyler. So we'll, we'll make the best of it. We're still hiring. If you know anybody that would like to work on trails and, and uh, have fun and get a little dirty and, and um, be out there on the trails with us, it's very rewarding or at Puffer's Pond. So if you know anybody, have them uh, apply online on the town website. 
Um, we were planning to support the Friends of Buffers Pond. They were supposed to have the pancake break breakfast a week from Saturday, but unfortunately, unfortunately, their volunteer organization was hit with COVID and they just don't feel like they can pull it off. So the pancake breakfast that was planned for Saturday, June 4th was canceled. So that's that's a bummer. It's a hit to our budget. Um, we count on, you know, between four and six thousand dollars every year um, to use on at Buffers Pond. So I'll have to make that up somewhere else. Um, let's see. We're prepping for the Amethyst Brook Bridge project. Aaron and I were out there with staff, uh, with field staff a week and a half ago or so. And we may come back to you with, a, we will come back to you with an update and, and maybe some suggested changes, minor changes, important uh, changes to that plan. Um, and again, we're not in a huge hurry there. We're gonna have to do that obviously um, during low water and uh, low flow in the amethyst. So um, look for um, some, some information coming back through Aaron on that, maybe at your next meeting or the meeting after that. Um, we do have all the funding for that project. So I would love to get it done this summer. Lots of standard mowing of trails going on, uh, trailheads, uh, parking areas, trying to finish parking areas at Fort River Farm, um, Podick and Catherine Cole out in North Amherst. Um, doing a lot of volunteer work. Um, Tyler Pease, our assistant land manager, has been working with a number of groups on the Robert Frost Trail, doing some, uh -huh. some all the permitted work uh, and some upland work that you all permitted through that Robert Frost Trail um, grant. Um, we have a wonderful kind of volunteer coordinator, David Mullins, who's, who's um, very handy and very good uh, woodworker. So it's great to have somebody like that on site. And they couple of Saturdays, they've had eight to 10 volunteers out there doing work on the Robert Frost Trail. So it's great to kind of get some of that, um, some of that um, unfinished work done. And then Aaron and I, as well as Brad and Tyler, we've been spending a fair amount of time on the flow structure, the combination, the project flow structure at Plumbrook Pond that is associated and related to the culvert replacement at the Kestrel Trust Office. And I don't know, Aaron, were you going to say more about the flow structure or do you want me to just give a quick summary or? Yeah, Dave, uh, feel free to give a breakdown. And if there's anything I can add, I will. Yeah, we had a great day last Friday um, was the day that we decided to uh, take one of the stop logs out of that flow structure at Plumbrook Pond. Mm -hmm. um, we had our engineer on site um, that we have hired to help us oversee the project. Um, I also invited the town engineer, but he was tied up with other things. Brad and Tyler were there. Actually, we had two engineers. Um, they're from Ty and Bond. No, they're not from Ty and Bond. Are they from GZA? Ty? GZA. And um, yeah, we had safety measures in place. And um, um, yeah, it went extremely well. We had the board out in probably 10 minutes. It's fascinating seeing this uh, 55 inch long stop log that has been in there. We don't know how long, but it is, it is weathered, it is worn. Uh, you can see the forces of water have, have reshaped it from its original shape. It's 55 inches long, about three inches thick and six inches wide, if you will. And we think there's about a dozen of these in this flow structure going down 10 to 12 feet or more. Mm. It's a little hard to tell because there's a lot of sediment built up but it's a very um, well-built flow structure. It's a little, we do have to be careful when we're out on it because we don't want anybody to end up inside the, the culvert that goes through the dam. That would be a very bad day. We ended the, after successfully uh, removing the flow, uh, the, uh, the first stop log to, to lower the pond, we had the fire department out there and we had a, a nice team, four or five, uh, um, fire department staff, and they, we, I invited them to see the flow structure just from a safety and emergency response uh, standpoint. Um, we walked them through the project, and then we walked them around the Kestrel Trust office so they would familiarize themselves with that. And then Aaron gave them an overview of the, the, um, the uh, culvert replacement, which of course is key because there will be some days when that culvert is removed where they cannot get a fire engine down the long Kestrel Trust uh, driveway. And has everybody been out there, by the way? Has everyone from the commission been to the Plumbrook Pond? 
Um, I, I, I've been there before it was Kestrel though. Yeah, we should really right when we I know that. everybody's busy and health issues and kids in school, but um, it would be wonderful to do a little walk and talk down there. There's a lot of there's a lot of stories to be told and and interesting things happening down there. So we bottom line was, cohesion day. Yeah. It was it was hugely successful. So um, Monday morning we took out the second stop log. And why don't I just, Aaron, maybe you could kind of jump in there. Those were my updates, but could you just remind everybody kind of what our goals? Why are we taking the stop logs off? Why are we why are we drawing down the pond before we replace the uh, the culvert? Yeah. So um, in December, I was made aware of the fact that the culvert was failing or in failure. And I went out and looked at it and realized that yeah, there's a pretty serious problem. They have uh, sinkholes forming underneath the pavement um, in the driveway. And so um, we had a structural engineer to take a look at it. And the issue with the culvert is that the sides are are failed as opposed to usually you see in those corrugated steel culverts the bottom fails which means that there's a little more time because the sides are still holding um, the weight but in this case the sides are what are failed um, and so because of that it was in structural failure deemed in structural failure and needing replacement um, the, repla the replacement pipe was designed we tried to conform to the stream crossing standards as closely as we possibly could, um, that culvert is is extremely undersized and also dangerously dangerously small um, for the velocity of water that come out of that spillway. Um, and so, I think all parties involved recognize the fact that this is an emergency. DEP recognized it as an emergency. The Office of Dam Safety recognized it as an emergency, and our engineer recognized it as an emergency. And uh, we did notify the Army Corps of Engineers that the work is going to be starting. The real challenge with the replacement is it being done sort of in the wet because the pump arounds are extremely expensive. Um, in terms of dewatering the area upstream um, and keeping the water flowing downstream. In this case, we're extremely lucky because there's a really, really um, uh, full stream just downstream of this culvert. So that stream is not gonna dry out. It's gonna stay flowing. Um, it's just the segment between the spillway and where the other stream comes in that's gonna be dry for a short period of time. Um, we're shooting for the first week of June for the culvert replacement at this point. Um, not positive because supply chain stuff is an issue. Um, the, the culvert itself is, is uh, manufactured. The problem is the, um, the flared ends on either side of the culvert. Um, the manufacture of those is what's holding up the, the train at this point. So it's, are those concrete? No, it's a oh. um, it's a yeah. sort of oblong um, uh, um, corrugated steel that's going to be placed in. It's going to be set into the ground, so it'll be um, there'll be we're going to do a, sort of a natural bottom channel within the pipe itself. Right, but I was talking about the flares. Oh um, no, the flares are also steel. Oh, I they believe. Are. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. So. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's coming together very nicely. Again, supply chain. So why are you drawing down the pond again? Oh, Aaron, yeah, finish on the drawdown. Well, because we need the, the work area where the culvert is taking place to be dry when the culvert is replaced so that it doesn't dump a bunch of sediment downstream. Yeah. So, the, so the, yeah, go ahead. the idea would be right now it's still flowing, but the idea would be we're doing an incremental drawdown um once we get it to the water level that and and this is also we we already have an order of conditions in place for the um weir board replacement we did that as part of our sweet alice trail work we recognized that the weir boards or the stop logs were in bad shape or they might be in bad shape because we hadn't had the inspection done but we confirmed that when we went out there and pulled one of them because um i mean the thing was like a sponge um so it's a safety issue that those need to be replaced. And so 
it's like killing two birds with one stone in a sense, like we're replacing the stop logs to put safe, safe new infrastructure in that dam so that it continues to function. And then allowing ourselves a couple day window when the stream will be dry um, for the culvert replacement. And just so you know, the, the stop logs, um, we are board stop logs um, are are interlocking, so they need to be they need to be milled. It's not just you know buy something off the shelf at Kohl's or Home Depot or wherever. So we've luckily got an Amherst resident who who has some real skills um, with milling, and he's volunteered to work with Brad and Tyler. Basically, take one of the old ones, you know, um, basically measure that out, and then fabricate those those new stop logs so that we can put them in place. We're not sure if we're gonna go all the way down at this point or how many we're gonna replace, but we'll we'll cross that bridge, so to speak, when we get there. So so it's quite an interesting project. And we're watching the we're watching the pond level. It is down a good four or five feet at this point. So uh, shoreline is exposed. Um, we just want to make sure that we we don't take it too far down and and uh, jeopardize um, you know all the critters that depend on, on that pond and the stream. So anyway, um, very exciting, interesting project, lots of uh, big learning curve. And um, yeah, Kestrel has been kept in the loop the whole time. By the way, I, I will say that, you know, the parking lot that uh, we did build out there that caused me great stress when I realized it was on a CR part of, of, of our conservation land is being extensively used. I mean, I was there a week ago Saturday I don't know, eight, eight o'clock in the morning, and it was full of birders who would park there for a birding trip around a birding class, I think, around the pond and up on the Mount Holyoke Range. So um, it's really getting well used. When you go by there, you just see people running, people taking their dog for a walk, birders, you know, it, it's um, it's getting getting full use. So anyway, happy to take any questions or on anything else that you see out there on the trails or Puffer's Pond or anywhere, Mount, Mount, Mount uh, Pollux. I'm sure it's uh, pretty easy to find, but is so there, were the volunteer days on the uh, Robert Frost Trail, are those like, uh, where's that posted? <laughs> um, How do you find out more information about that? That's an interesting question, Fletcher. I don't know as we reached out too much because David Mullins who volunteered to pull that group together had okay. a group of, it turns out this is a section kind of near Amherst Woods and and they were kind of a group that used the Robert Frost Trail in that yeah. section and said, man, we'd love to, we'd love to work with you. So we kind of said, David, you know, uh, Tyler will be there on this Saturday and that Saturday at 9 a.m. It will work nine to noon, gotcha. we'll bring materials. Um, okay. So yeah, but we will be having more of those. I think we're we're working with Kestrel a little bit on our improving our our volunteer organization because I think we're such a small staff, field staff that it just totally. you know it takes takes people to organize other people. So yeah, Kestrel had to adopt a section of Robert Frost Trail, um, which I signed up for, but I think it's sort of like on hold. I think they're waiting for it. I don't know what they're waiting for. I, I followed up just to make sure they got my submission, but um, that's the thing. So they ha if you go to their website, it's somewhere out there and they've like split it into different sections. And I think you can like share sections with other people um, and you just become sort of a steward of a section and take care of it and let people know when um, maintenance is needed. Right, that's a good point, Michelle. So what we did, we attended, um, Brad, Brad and or Tyler actually spoke on that, um, at that, that uh, virtual meeting. And what we agreed with Kestrel is the Robert Frost Trail is so long and goes through so many of their towns and we have staff and we have lots of volunteers. So we kind of, we volunteered to organize um, trail adopters in Amherst, and they're going to organize trail adopters kind of to the south, South Hadley, Granby, et cetera, and then to the north, Leverett on up into uh, Montague and, and, and Wendell and, you know, that way. So um, I think out of that group, we had, a, a, there was a large group, I think it was like 65 people, 20 wanted to adopt one section or another or work on the Robert Frost Trail in Amherst. 
So we have that list. So we're going to begin to reach out and maybe you're on that list. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're going to begin to, to reach out to you and others in Amherst to say, okay. And part of the reason for that is, you know, we're out there all the time. Kestrel is not. And we wanted to, you know, sometimes um, the best intentions of trail adopters or trail volunteers sometimes, and we've had this happen to us, sometimes people get a little carried away. Um, and may go into wetland areas or clear too much or whatever. So we, we wanted to have our, our fingers on the pulse a little bit more there and, and just, you know, again, set people out. If you wanted to take this section, fine, just so we know who's doing it and, and we can give some ideas on, on uh, how to do it and maybe even provide some tools, so. That makes sense. Thanks for the update. Hi, Leroy. Hello. Sorry, I'm late, everybody, but I'm here. Happy to see you. <laughs> uh, where are we at? <laughs> so Dave just gave us a little update, um, kind of a, a little more of an extended update on field stuff that's going on right now in conservation areas. And we have about six minutes before the hearing opens for the bylaw regs. Um, I actually had a request for an emergency certification that came in um, and Dave gave me the green light to issue it today. So I don't know if the commission wants to um, entertain a motion to, to issue on that while we're waiting. Um, it's 16 Bridge Street and um, there are two maple trees that are leaning over somebody's roof and the insurance company um, is really concerned about the safety of the trees and so the landowner would like to remove them with an emergency certification. Um, I haven't been out on site but I will go out and take photos of them um, before they're cut and um, really we would just need a motion to issue the emergency certification so the trees could be removed. I'm okay with that. Yeah, what was the address again there? 16 Bridge Street. I move uh, to issue an emergency certification for 16 Bridge Street, removal of two maples. I second that. So, Leroy, do you want to, do you want to take the reins or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Jen's uh, not here today. Yeah, I see that now. Oh, I'm sorry. Long day. Uh, let's go then, Larry. Hi. Michelle. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi. Andre. Hi. All right. Passes. Okay. Um, so just to give you guys um, an update, um, we were supposed to be issuing an order of conditions tonight um, because we closed the public hearing at the last meeting for 398 and 406 Northampton Road. It's the um, UMass Five College Federal Credit Union relocation for their um, for their new branch. Um, they actually requested um, that we hold off on issuing the order of conditions, and they grant they have requested basically a 21 day extension. Um, of the commission granting the order of conditions um, because on June 1st they have a meeting with the planning board and there may be some minor plan revisions that get incorporated and again if it's something like relocating a bike rack that would be pretty simple for us to you know um, just use the revised plan sheet but I already informed them if they have any major changes that they're going to have to reopen the public hearing so so they're aware of that but um just to let everybody know that um 398 and 406 will be um handled at the next meeting um also i had checked in with jen briefly um i don't think there's any reason for us to enter into executive session um at this meeting so um what we may want to do is um, just make a motion to have the executive session on the next agenda um, in case we need to go into executive session for that discussion. Um, and that's the zero Tuckerman Lane site. 
Um, lastly, uh, we did have a request from um, the owners at Canton Ave um, to be on the agenda tonight. I was kind of hoping to keep it just the bylaw um, regs, but they um, are going to be popping in around 8 o'clock, um, 8.15, basically um, to have a discussion about how to move forward on that. And I can give you guys, or I, what I'd like to do is give you guys a little update of that discussion before we sort of collectively discuss it, just um, so that you guys understand from a regulatory standpoint where that permit is at and kind of what the options are. I have a question about the three week um, extension request that does that put us out into the third Wednesday of the month? Like, do we are we gonna have to meet and vote on what, that on the eighth? The 21 days? No, that's not that's not that doesn't mean that. Um, so Michelle, just that's a great question. When we close a public hearing, we have to issue an order of conditions within 21 days. That's a, a state regulation. So um, because we're two weeks out from the last meeting, that means that we at our next meeting would be over 21 days. And that's a requirement for the applicant to protect them to make sure that we're being timely in the manner that we issue our orders of conditions and not making the applicant sit and wait for it for a month or two. Um, so the what they granted was an extension of that 21 day period to allow them to get feedback from the planning board if there's any other revision. So it's not that we have to within 21 days of tonight take some action, it's more so they're granting an extension to that 21 days so that at our next meeting we can issue the order of conditions without exceeding that regulatory Got threshold. It. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. That was pretty perfect timing. <laughs> um, Leroy, how do you want to handle the, the hearing for the um, bylaw regs? Do you want me to I, I assume you wanted to present that. Um, <laughs> I hope you want to present it. <laughs> You're on mute though. I'm happy to present. <clears throat> I guess I just didn't realize it was actually in a hearing. Uh, does that mean I have to read something to open a hearing? It's not like a Wetland Protection Act um, hearing. Um, but what I can do really quickly is so yeah, it's it's not the same as um, opening a, a hearing under the Wellness Protection Act. Um, let's see. Oh, let me look at my fingers on it quickly. Um, I was just looking to see if I could find the meeting charges to see if I could pull it up really quickly, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. So, um, Leroy, what I can do is um, just open up the, um, the legal ad so that you can see it and read that. I think that might be the easiest way to go. Okay, no. Just bear with me for one second. So I'm just going to take out a piece of this so that it's a little easier for you to read. Um, and then I'm going to push my screen. Okay. So just this part right here. Right. Amherst Conservation Commission will hold the bar on the following virtual public meeting under Mass German Law, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Rivers Protection Act, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, the public meeting is 7.30 p.m. Review and approve proposed amendments to the Town of Amherst Bylaw Regulations promulgated by the Wetlands Protection Act 
uh, wetlands protection section under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31. I'm just going to queue up the presentation for you. I can actually probably just share it from my screen if that works with you. Or... Yeah, if, whatever is comfortable for you, Leroy, go for it. Oh, all right, guys. Uh, hopefully, I won't lose anybody. It is a long law. And there's a lot of detail here. The overall theme is this is the first time everyone's seeing it, I think, in whole. Um, so the overall theme is please take your time to read it on your own, delve into it. Again, this is first time look. Um, everything I'm going to be reviewing here are just overview changes or general descriptions of changes. Um, I think I listed maybe two or three specific changes. So, hey, hey Gainer, are you supposed to be sharing your screen right now? Not quite yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let me pop that up right now. Let's see. Um, all right, everyone seeing that? Um, so yeah, in general, uh, I would really like everybody to take their time uh, on any particular section or hopefully with the whole thing. And with that, I will get right into it. Um, so we are the bylaw and regulations review subcommittee. Uh, the committee was made up of two members. Michelle was the chair, you know, myself, and then Aaron was a staff member attache. Uh, the three of us met, <clears throat> excuse me, um, every first and third Monday from January 7th until April 29th. Most of the meetings were about an hour long. Some of them did run closer to two. Uh, the videos of all those meetings uh, along with the notes are uh, on the slide there. And both of those links can be found at the Conservation Commission website. Uh, well, we ran along. Uh, so we were, a subcommittee formed to uh, revise the regulations. That is different than revising or creating a bylaw. The bylaw uh, does not change, has not changed. Uh, it says that there is a commission that can create regulations. So what we did was look at those regulations that we have um, and decide where and how we could change those. Um, the major theme here, and for all towns who are committing any sort of changes to their bylaws, is that it should be by the town, for the town. It should address town specific issues um, and it should be based in things uh, or ways the town has tried to solve those issues before. They should be provable. Uh, moving to the background on this a little bit. <clears throat> uh, There's a State Wetlands Protection Act. I'm sure we all know that was in the past uh, 1972, most recently amended 2014. Under that and with Massachusetts protections for home rule, it allows for uh, towns in Massachusetts to make their own uh, more stringent protections, not less stringent protections, in addition to the wetland protection. And that's what these are. That's what has existed here since 2014 in its most current version. That's the one we're revising. And hopefully this will be the ones finalized this year in 2022. Um, the background on these changes, uh, they started, I believe, I can't find my note here. I think it was back in 2018 was the uh, beginning of uh, the revisions on this. So the three main contributors at the time were Beth Wilson, who was our former uh, wetlands um, agent, Brian Yangness, who was our building commissioner, building inspector. Chair of the CONCOM. Oh, I'm sorry, former chair of the CONCOM, and Rob Moore is our building inspector. Correct. Um, so obviously it's been over four plus years. When you actually look at the edits uh, on the document, all the edits have been tracked. There is a total of over 1,000 edits on this from various people, and a lot of those include Aaron, um, and then of course, Michelle, myself, a few other people, um, but again, over 1,000. So how we went about doing this, this was a page-by-page -page effort. Uh, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, 
significant amount of uh, offline research, uh, especially with Michelle and Vernal Pools. Um, the process was to review the original page by page and suggest uh, changes to Aaron. Aaron would then take those changes, write them into a form of draft to send to KP Law, who's the town attorney. Uh, they would make any legal revisions, uh, any comments there, and send it back to us, uh, where it'd be finalized, well, not finalized, but the version we're presenting to you, put into a clean version. <clears throat> The two biggest goals here um, were to make it approachable, make it consistent. Approachable in that um, we thought that a lot of applicants uh, simply had trouble understanding if, how our rules worked. Uh, and that is understandable. If you look at the current version, there's a lot of uh, inconsistent wording. Uh, there is a lot of uh, thing. Well, we'll see as we go on, but there are things that I think quite fit where they should, et cetera. And it could, it, could and did create a lot of confusion. We've seen examples of that, especially around bridal pools. Um, making it consistent had more to do actually with um, lining it up with the state's Wetland Protection Act. Um, there's a lot that was very different from Wetland Protection Act with our bylaw. Uh, for instance, our bylaw did not actually mention riverfront at all, which is a big portion of the Wetland Protection Act. Uh, so those are the goals there. Jumping in, this is where we're actually going to start um, with our revisions. Uh, if you have a copy of the old ones, um, you can follow along by section title. If you have a copy of the new ones, it should read pretty, uh, pretty like you're seeing here, section by section. Uh, this first page here is just a, this is just a snapshot. It's not the whole thing of the table of contents. <clears throat> the only uh, point I wanted to make here is that the original ones do not have a table of contents at all so we figured that was major benefit um, also it doesn't show here but i believe aaron correct me if i'm wrong that eventually these will be clickable so that you can jump in the document that's the hope yep all right excellent uh, part one there are six parts guys so hold on with me i hope we'll make it through part one introduction actually part one i should note is called the general provision so section a is uh, the introduction uh, we just moved some language around, really, um, and it inserted some reference numbers. Um, I won't bring this up every single time, but it's a great uh, example of how we tried to change things around. We put in a direct reference, and we tried to make the word consistent. Um, Session B is the purpose. Nothing really changed here, but I do want to make it clear to the public and other commissioners that the Wetland Protection Act protects eight values. Uh, and our bylaw, you'll see, is I think 12. Um, so we, the other four are additional simply from Amherst or simply for Amherst um, by Amherst. Section three is jurisdiction. <clears throat> um, nothing really changed again here, but uh, another great example of lack of wording or confusing wording. Uh, in the original, it said water bounty set forth above. The new one says, river or perennial stream, i.e. riverfront area. That seems a lot clearer to me. I hope to you as well. Um, this is part one continued. Uh, there were, excuse me, I'm sorry. There was some major wording changes in uh, the latter part of part one, section D, that was exceptions and variances. Uh, when we passed this by KP law, uh, they found it to be unintelligible and in, in some cases, perhaps not even legally defensible. <clears throat> so uh, we essentially had KP law rewrite the entire thing or, or reword the entire thing. Um, in the end, we moved, we changed the words, exceptions and variances a bit and we moved them through later in the document. You will see as we go through. Let me, let me, uh, ask, a, let me ask a question. Please, Larry, yeah, absolutely. Um, I assume that if I went and got the uh, the the clean version from the web website, it's it's what this version looks like. Yep. And if I found things in there that were mistakes or otherwise, I should pass that on to Aaron. You should, but you're bringing up something I forgot to mention. Um, the clean version that you are seeing online, the one that you will be able to download. Uh, you might very well find a lot of grammatical, small, or spelling errors, maybe spaces missing, punctuation, things like that. 
We have not done that clean edit yet. So you can hold off on those. Uh, that's that's what they were. There were things like that that I saw in there that was wording that was, I mean, anyway. I definitely appreciate it, but we, uh, that's the final step. So it will be cleaned up again. <laughs> uh, but it was wording wise, this is the final. Um, right, so we're reviewing content right now, just to be clear, and then there's going to be an editorial proofing following this. So I, I do know that there's errors in there, but try and look beyond them. But thank you for noting. Um, I was just clarifying. <laughs> uh, uh, significant change here is that uh, we made it so the NNY is simply required within 100 foot of resource areas every time. Uh, previously, I believe it was required up to 50 feet, and then there was the questionable zone between 50 and 100. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, the third isn't really a change. It's more that we just made it clear. The burden of proof is on the applicant in all cases. Um, they would have to prove to us how something doesn't impact the resource area. We don't have to prove that it does. Um, we actually had that come up a couple times. So this is an example of uh, rules that are being drawn up based on our experience with the town. Hey, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. You, these are great. And by the way, thank you guys for your work on this. But when you were developing these, did you guys look at other towns to see what they were doing and on yeah. experience? We did, Laura, and actually there'll be some great examples of that a little bit later, but that was right. oh, wait. <laughs> uh, and probably something else I forgot. Again, I'm a little frazzled today, I apologize. But um, as far as background research, things we did, consulting local area towns, definitely one of them. We tried to keep it as close as possible in geographic area, but also population, because um, that's significant. Uh, talking, reading with other experts, especially when it comes down to specific issues, trying to ascertain context of the original edits from 2019. Um, and that's actually all we did, and then KP Law Review. But thanks for that question, important note. Uh, going to part two, so second part here. These are all definitions, so it's pretty straightforward. You'll just see the list of words and how we define them. So I just pulled a few that um, we thought were important. Um, alterations, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Oh, that was... In alterations, we've uh, included that you can no longer, or the conversion of land cover, either temporarily or permanently, is uh, a type of alteration. It seems pretty commonsensical. It was not in there before. Uh, we include a definition for bordering vegetated wetland. Um, not significantly changed. There'll be a whole section on that later, but it, it just wasn't a definition before. Likewise, uh, we include a definition for clear cutting. Um, Fletcher, if you have comments, we'd definitely be open to hearing from you on this. Michelle did a good amount of research on this, as did Aaron. Um, but that was one that is brand new and not just Fletcher, obviously. Anyone from the public or commissioners, feel free to check that one out. A couple more definitions. Uh, competent source. This is a pretty important one. Um, we define the competent source again. You can check out the document yourself. We give a list of several examples of types of people who could be such, um, but we also gave a basis for what uh, any person could be uh, with the correct amount of years of experience and degree. Uh, that is an important one for us because previously, uh, words like uh, it's having proof or having a, and a person uh, would be uh, good enough evidence. It, it could be anybody off the street. It could be someone who has no wetland experience, et cetera. Uh, we thought it was important to define that, especially since we use uh, or request competence in our sourcing so many times throughout the rest of this document. Impervious surface, um, a new one, important one, nothing interesting, but important and new. Isolated vegetated wetlands, same thing. Um, vernal pool is an important definition. We will talk about it so much later that I'm not going to now, but just wanted to uh, bring it to your attention to check out. Brings us part three, procedures. Um, the time period. Uh, 
Okay. <clears throat> uh, we did make some small changes here that I do think are important. For instance, uh, we have added uh, button notification as a requirement to NRAD. So that was not previously the case. Um, Sorry, can I ask? There's not a you don't have to do a butter notification for ANRAD in the um, Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, not currently in our bylaw, but it has been added to it now. Yes. Yeah, but it, it's not in the standard. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and, well, again, we're trying to make it more in line with the actual Wetland Protection Act. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's in line with the Wetlands yeah. Protection Act. Okay. Thank you. I was confused. Yeah. And one, the, one other point on that, which we did get some public comment on, um, like the railroad had requested a waiver of a butter notification requirements. And so that was one item that we did add in was to allow waiver of a butter notification requirements if the waiver was requested. And there's a provision for if um, the commission feels that the work being proposed isn't going to impact the butters that they could waive that requirement. But again, I mean, these aren't things that are set in stone. We can we can talk about these changes more in detail. Um, if there are sections that the commission doesn't feel comfortable with, we don't have to, um, you know, there, there are still changes that can be made, but I just wanted to point that out. Very true. And it's, uh, I'm no, keep forgetting things. Another thing I forgot to say at the beginning, there will be two more meetings on this, uh, and that is intentional. We want people to digest this and come back with comments. Um, it's not finalized yet. It won't be uh, until after that third meeting sometime. Um, we'll have to be voted on ratified by the full commission. Um, <clears throat> the uh, only other bit that I wanted to mention is that we've added the Mullen rule which allows commissioners who miss a particular site visit or a particular hearing to participate in the rest of those hearing meetings. Uh, we've had that issue in the past. It's very helpful. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, this is, we are still, this is all section three, I mean, uh, part three, different sections, uh, section for RDAs. Uh, we have the button notification. We made the wording, that's an example of how we made the wording consistent with WPA, but uh, if you go in there, there's a lot of, uh, Aaron and KP Law did a lot of work to make that much more consistent with the state. Um, the biggest addition we made reads, the commission may require as discretion stormwater BMP, so best management practices. What this really allows for the commission to do is use its judgment to reduce burdens to applicants. Um, if you say that everybody requires, uh, or we require everybody to do stormwater BMPs, uh, long story short, it is a lot of math, a lot of professionals, and a lot of money to the applicants. So they can really overburden uh, single family homeowners or even smaller projects. However, uh, we do want those things to happen on larger projects, bigger development, et cetera. Um, so that is why we put it in as may require at its discretion so that we can have the ability to do both sides of that. Uh, any questions on that one? Okay. Notices of intent. Uh, this is very similar changes to the RDA as far as wording and making it legally defensible. Uh, the uh, first major addition is uh, Activities which occur outside of the resource area that have negatively impacted a resource area are violations and subject to enforcement. Uh, this is really important and to put simply, um, just because it's not in our jurisdiction, if you're doing something that affects things in our jurisdiction, uh, we can now uh, bring enforcement upon you. Majorly helpful. <laughs> um, we, uh, the, Um, bit that is says recording in land court. Uh, this is about, and I, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, we've been trying to do this as like a rule of thumb practice, but we're now putting it in officially to the bylaw, which is that when you have an owner of conditions, it's put on to the deed so that it is in the land court so the future buyers know what they're dealing with. Is that correct, Aaron? 
Yeah, and that was that was already previously in there, but the, it was like six paragraphs long um, yeah. with directions about recording in land court. And what we did was remove a lot of um, redundant language and extraneous wording that wasn't necessary. And now it's much more simplified um, and shortened up. So it's clear it's required to record it and it doesn't go into a lot of um, additional language explaining the whole process of recording. All right, uh, sections F, G, H. Uh, most of this is unchanged, which is why I'm not going into a lot of details here. Um, oh, this is e-copy safe paper there, but that's actually a point for the last two as well. Uh, we've uh, decided that we can now legally accept and request actually uh, an e-copy in addition to the hard copy. Before I believe it was two hard copies. Um, do, 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 do. Um, but I don't know when you want to field it, but there's a question from the public. Oh, oh thank you, Michelle, for keeping an eye sure. on that. We can bring that in right now. Uh, oh, can I? Oh, Here, can you see them? Because I'm sharing my screen. Let me see. Hold on, hold on one second. Let me. Um, do, oh, I'm not the host. Dave's the host. Um, um, should we wait? So I can either reclaim my hostness, or Dave could make um, Leroy a co-host. He could pull in, or Dave can pull in the member of the public to talk. Can you remind me how to do that? Oh, I'll, I'll just do it, David. It's okay. You, you, I didn't want to be. I didn't over. want to be rude and. Um, no, absolutely. Take over. Host. Um, hold on. Bear with me just a moment. While I, um, I'm just gonna allow. Sarah Matthews has her hand raised. I'm gonna allow her to talk. Hi. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wondered when the public was supposed to be able to. I just wanted to make sure I was. You know, that's all. I just let me know. I don't need to talk now. I just want to know when to, I can ask a question. <clears throat> uh, well, when I say you can ask one now, we only have one public hand up there. Yes. Yeah, go for it right now. Well, it's, but it's not about what you've already done. I mean, is that a, it's, oh, oh okay. Well, then, you so know what I mean? I think, I'm sorry, I just didn't know when it was a procedural question about when the public would be allowed to. Uh, well, as it stands now, since we don't have a, a ton of public, I would say you can feel free to ask your questions about the subjects as they come up. So just feel free to pop your hand up again when whenever you're ready to speak about this happening. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. All right. Um, there is a big change on section F here. Uh, it's a pretty distinct list of reasons why a hearing can be continued. The idea here is that uh, we all know that we've had a few hearings that have been open for years at a time. Um, and we're trying to put a stop to that um, by having just a black and white list of reasons it can be continued. If it doesn't fit those, then it just simply cannot without hard feelings. <laughs> Uh, extensions and enforcement. Um, similar to that, we have uh, pretty distinct things here on why permits can be extended and denied. These are actually not new sections, um, but cleaned up quite a bit. And then the uh, violation section, we just specified more of them. Uh, give me one second here. I think I have a note on this. <laughs> No, I do not. I apologize. Moving right on, certificates of compliance. Um, majorly no changes here. Uh, the changes that were made in warranty were to make it closer to the state's WPA. Do, 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 do. Um, there are some things uh, that people may not be considering that uh, do cost the town money, and that includes. Um, people, i.e. Aaron, going out for site visits on emergency visits uh, or emergency certifications. Uh, we, we have a debate about that a little bit later, actually. We can bring that up later. I'm sorry to double down now. 
um, elemental P. Uh, this is rounding out section three. <clears throat> Again, most of these sections unchanged or unchanged in content, changed in wording. Um, would like to point out that generally speaking, to be considered an emergency, the situation must be an immediate or rapidly, a rapidly growing concern to public health. Um, an emergency certification still requires site visit and the work is a, a work allowed is limited to 30 days. Um, I, I, I think most of the commission's aware of that, but since this is a public hearing, I thought it was really important that the public know that we only, emer we only issue emergency certifications. Um, due to concerns of public health, immediate public health. Uh, moving on to part four. This is the big part. Uh, it's called Standards for Inland Wetlands. So each of these sections is uh, one of our resource area types, uh, the vernal pool or what the riverfront would be. Uh, each of those uh, uh, sections will have a preamble the preamble uh, discusses uh, the interests that we're trying to protect in the town. Um, the second portion will be, we'll just keep going, we'll keep going, I'm sorry. Uh, it is the largest and most changed part of the revised bylaw. Many of the word, wording changes came into compliance with WAPA um, and also many of the wording changes um, were done in in respect to experience we've had in the town. Um, moving on to the first one, this would be an easy way to talk about the rest of these sections. So again, I said they'll be broken down to preamble, which defines our interest protected, then uh, the definitions and char uh, critical characteristics. That's essentially defining the type of area. Um, and then the general uh, performance standards, those are the do's and don'ts within those areas. Uh, so starting with banks, uh, uh, it is important that uh, we noted that perennial stream banks are riverfront. I think that makes sense, but uh, there was some question about that if you read the original law. We put in that stream crossings must be at least 1.2 bank, uh, times bank full width. Um, there is a lot more in there. I encourage you to read, but that's the important takeaway. Um, and perhaps the biggest takeaway is that there is now officially a 50-foot no disturb for any reason, really, on riverfronts. So that's a new, that's a full new, the 50-foot no disturb. I believe it is fully new. I believe we had a no disturb early, uh, previously that was 30 foot early. 30, yeah, okay. That's why. Yeah, is and we correct? can talk about all those all those in more in depth. Again, these are these are putting concepts out there based on what yep. other towns are doing, but we can talk about them. Excellent. Yeah, I was just uh, for my clarification because I was remembered the bylaw is thirty feet, but now we're going to fifty. Okay, just an on river front. Okay, thank you. Do, do, do. Uh, BBW boring vegetative wetland. Uh, most of the information here is the same. Uh, when I say proper references given to the WPA, I mean that when you're reading this, you will see uh, letter number references. Let me just pull one randomly right now. Uh, 310 CMR 10.55. So actual numbers and references you can go ahead and look up on your own. Um, again, that's throughout the document and we really hope that that helps clarify to people or at least give them the opportunity to go look into things on their own. Um, the preamble on this one is a good example of our new organization or format. There are headers of each uh, interest protected, for instance, aquacultural value or agricultural value, um, groundwater, et cetera. And then under those headers, it explains what BBW does for that. Or riverfront banks would each of these sections will have a preamble. They're all divided the same way with headers to find the interest and under them, the interest of the Um uh, What's happening there? There we go. IVW, isolated vegetated wetlands. Again, guys, when, um, when I say this is big stuff, 
these are the meetings that uh, we had for two hours apiece. Um, these are the sheets that KP Law had to work on several times uh, over the course of weeks. Um, so I am in no way attempting to give you any level of detail on this. Again, this is more of just a, I'm trying to point you in the direction of where to look for big changes. <clears throat> save you some time, but feel free to read deeply in the whole thing. Um, the major difference here on IVW was in the beginning, or not in the beginning, in, our in the current version that we are revising, uh, BVW and IVW were connected. Um, vernal pools were separated off into something different. Um, we decided to separate BVW and IVW and put IVW with vernal pools. Uh, so I believe as it reads is um, isolated vegetated and wetlands and vernal pools. Uh, so separate but equal. <laughs> uh, we did this, uh, one of the major issues that we've had, at least since I've been on the CONCOM, has been uh, treatment of vernal pools. Uh, and basically uh, all applicants are willing to treat them as is proper. Many applicants have trouble knowing what is proper. We have hoped that uh, we're going to, I'm sorry, Aaron, you have a question? Here? Finish your thought, Leroy. It's before you jump to the next slide. All right. Um, we decided, well, we were hoping to make this as clear as possible. So now, again, it says it several different ways throughout this document, but now in Amherst, vernal pools, whether certified or not, will be treated the same and whether or not uh, they are within or without a vegetated wetland, they will be treated the same. In fact, later in the document, uh, we state that all vernal pools are de facto uh, land subject to flood because they flood. Uh, so that's that. Um, Aaron, did you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to, um before you move on to some additional resource areas, I wanted to just give you guys some sort of concrete examples of what um, Leroy is, has been talking about. In the previous regulations for the, the resource area sections, there was some really serious inconsistencies between um, our bylaw regulations and the Wetland Protection Act. Um, how, I'll, just to try to, to try to give you an example, there were multiple sections of our bylaw regulations where there was, say, five out of 10 performance standards pulled from the Wetland Protection Act. And then we had, say, three that were unique to Amherst. Um, what we have done is we've taken now all of the performance standards under the Wetland Protection Act and then reintroduced our unique um, more strict, stringent performance standards below that. So um, previously we had a lot of problems where when applicants came through and we were trying to hold them to the same standard as the Wetlands Protection Act, they'd say, well, wait a second, your bylaw doesn't say that here. Um, and so I don't know why certain performance standards were used from the Wetland Protection Act and not all of them but now all of those performance standards are incorporated so it's apples to apples and then at the bottom of the resource area performance standards um, our more specific um, standards are listed there that are just just specific to amherst the other thing was our definitions weren't consistent so how something was defined under the wetland protection act versus how something was defined under our bylaw were two different things and they should be fairly consistent except under our bylaw we might allow more um, leeway for including areas that the wetland protection act does not and so that's how it is now um, as as Leroy mentioned and I'm sure he's going to mention in the upcoming slides we didn't have a riverfront resource area listed in there and I don't know why riverfront was left out but riverfront is specifically mentioned in our bylaw and so it needs to have its own resource area section. So when you see the number of pages that were added, that was specifically because of Riverfront. Um, and then getting to um, the vernal pool issue, I just wanted to mention that vernal pools were previously a subsection of isolated vernal pools. And 
what's extremely confusing was how um, under our local bylaw regulations. Um, so for example, bordering vegetated wetlands and isolated vegetated wetlands were one resource area. But under the Wetlands Protection Act, they're broken out into two separate ones. So we've broken them out into two separate ones so that we, again, are apples to apples with the Wetland Protection Act. Similarly, isolated land subject to flooding and bordering land subject to flooding were previously separated under our bylaw regulations, but they are under one resource area under the Wetland Protection Act. So those sections got combined again so that they're consistent with the Wetland Protection Act. We don't want our bylaw regs to be so different from the Wetland Protection Act. We want them to, to align with one another and be very clear where we are more strict. And so that's what we've tried to do. So anyway, I didn't mean to jump in there, but I wanted to just give some specific examples of what we were doing. No, it's really helpful. Uh, and again, the really important part of being consistent with WPA is not just for ease of understanding, but for legal defensibility. Uh, but uh, moving right ahead. Uh, bottom of that says big thanks to Michelle for her work on this section. Uh, Aaron was just talking about the definitions. Under this section, like I said, it will read at the top, isolated vegetated wetlands and vernal pools. So there are two different definitions in here. Uh, one for isolated vegetated wetlands and one for vernal pools. Uh, Michelle essentially uh, did all of the research for that definition and created what I deem to be pretty strong work here. So we thank her for that. Thank you, Leroy. Aaron did a lot of work on that one too. So joint oh. efforts. Thank you guys you. all did a great job. Thanks so much for all the time putting into this. It's clear there's tons of hours. So um, it's awesome. Um, land underwater. Uh, I I will not lie. I was caught a little off guard by the fact that we had this, <laughs> but I was happy that we did. Um, it was probably the least change of the resource area ones, so that worked out. Uh, most of the information is the same. Again, good example of the formatting change. Now matching WPA preamble in the same orders. Um, and again, uh, we mentioned these stream crossings at one point to expect for with, I feel like uh, my short time in the commission, two years or so, I've seen questions about this probably five to six times. So I, I think it's really important that it's in there, even though it's a little redundant. Okay. Can I ask actually real quick about the uh, stream crossing Did that so that's like even like like a culvert or something or you're talking is it it's like a permanent crossing right Aaron? yeah I mean any any crossing and of a um, perennial stream water of the United States it doesn't matter if it's perennial or intermittent um, has to is required under state and federal law to meet the stream crossing standards yeah okay all right Yep, clarification for me, thank you. And that's why with our culvert replacement project, we had to notify the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> uh, lands subject to flooding. Um, this, uh, Aaron said that the document got a lot longer just strictly due to riverfront. That's not entirely true. Uh, there were a couple of sections that got longer uh, because we had to add wording or we had to increase some protections. Uh, that was one of the cases here. Uh, we have, uh, go ahead. Aaron. Well, and that wasn't because we were adding protections necessarily. What that was, was that there was protections under the Wetland Protection Act that weren't under our bylaw. So we added those in so that they're consistent. Exactly. So just to pull that together. Um, I think Aaron just actually mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, but we now have separate definitions for bordering and isolated land subject to flooding for the same reason, consistency with WPA. Um, the big one for us here was that uh, the vernal pools and IVW are considered land subject to flooding. This is new. I uh, don't think it's that controversial. Um, and I believe it just uh, doubly makes clear that vernal pools are protected. Any thoughts on that from anybody? 
Do, do, do. A riverfront. Uh, as Aaron said, this is the, the bulk of what's been added page wise to the document. I think the riverfront section, without exaggeration, is close to the size of the original. Uh, that said, uh, as I said throughout this, you'll have to read it through your, on your own time. Take your time. Uh, I really love the preamble on this one. Uh, in this current format, it does not have the headers in it. So it's not a great example of the new formatting, but it is a great example of how many things uh, we should and do protect. Um, the big additional change for us, or the uh, important part for Amherst is this bottom line says streams with watersheds greater than 0.5 square miles will be deemed perennial. Um, I think we all remember a couple cases anyway, uh, where the current law has uh, two methods under which we can uh, determine a uh, stream to be perennial. Uh, with our additional wording here, it says that anything deemed with 0.5 miles squared from competent sources, uh, so that we may we have a much wider ability to take in sourcing from other areas. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can just go willy nilly and call something a half square mile when it's not, or that again, we can pick anybody off the street who will say it's a half square mile. That's a important use, usage of that uh, competent source definition uh, from earlier, uh, but that is the new deal. So hopefully we will have a little less resistance in the future with that. Thank I you. ask um, real yeah. briefly about that point. Um, so when we're, you know, obviously like Tambrook is obviously the one here that sticks out like a sore thumb. What's the stream stats, the stat for that again, the size of the of of the watershed in order to deem it again? That's a, you're opening a huge. <laughs> Don't bring it up. A okay. Huge can of words with that. Well, no. So this the the automatically generated stream stats report put yeah. it at like 0.49, but when we actually looked at the watershed and realized there was errors with the automatically generated report it put it over a half square mile um it mm. the the issue with the half square mile thing and why we added that in was because um the wetland protection act regulations are not very clear and they're not very good in that particular section about overturning the um uh intermittent to perennial factor right. And so, um, and also I think it's what's clear is that, what's unclear is that you can actually edit in stream stats, you can edit the watershed to be more accurate. Um, and secondary to that is that like the second subsection to overturn intermittent to perennial requires, um, I think it's 75% stratified drift if the watershed is over a half square mile. So this gives us a little bit more flexibility to call it perennial without having to meet those, either of those specific regulatory definitions. Yeah, good. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, I forgot what the um, threshold was when stream stats. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask, open any commissioner questions on this one? Because again, this is one slide, but probably the biggest que uh, section. So if there's any off the top questions, I'm happy to take them right now. But we'll probably have questions more so next meeting once you've read it. And again, th this section is very consistent with the Wetland Protection Act, with the exception of that, that one detail, the half square mile detail. Um, next slide might actually be one of our more controversial. Uh, again, none of this is in stone. That's why we're having this meeting. So please take a peek at it and tell us what you think. Um, buffer zones, which is actually considered a resource, M, uh, resource area, uh, we have setbacks for. We have increased, I think, all but one of the setbacks. Um, building setback for commercial, industrial was kept the same. None were reduced. Um, all of these increases, uh, was it Laura early asked about other towns? All of these increases were definitely done with an eye toward other towns. 
um, Ann and I toward our history. We have not redone them in some time. It says there 2014, those are the regs we're currently working under, but I believe Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, that those were numbers were unrevised from the previous version at that time. So the version that Beth and Bryony and Rob um, adjusted did bring the um, uh, driveways, parking lots, and other roads up to the 30 foot no disturb. And so all of them were going to be consistent 30 foot no disturb um, based on their revisions. The, the 50 foot came from, um, so Northampton has 100 foot no disturb, unless you're actually working in an area that's an you know, an, um, an urban zoned district. Um, towns like South Hadley have a 50 foot no disturb. So we were really looking at what other towns are doing. And also um, based on my experience, looking at sites where we allowed a parking lot to be within 25 feet of a wetland, um, a lot of times what ends up happening is you have the parking lot and then there's drainage coming out of the parking lot into the wetland. And so, observing that there are impacts and we're getting extremely close um, and and by the time you factor in grading you're actually within like 10 feet of a wetland um, so we're really trying to um, take that into consideration and and firm up our protections a little bit because we realize that now we're moving into more marginal sites there's not as much land area available and as as we develop more and more, that pressure is going to be greater and greater on the wetlands. So we're trying to really um, broaden the protections here. And, and that's why we are bringing this by you for review. But um, again, this is, <laughs> this is what I'd like to see. And this is what the, you know, the, the review committee um, discussed to, to propose to the full commission. But if commissioners are uncomfortable with this as a whole, we can still adjust these numbers. So I want to make that clear. I just want to reiterate that um, it's sort of overdue for a revisitation of these um, numbers and that we're still actually less than many of our surrounding towns in terms of our setbacks. So just for some context when looking at the comparison. Uh, for my part, during those meetings, I would say uh, same thing as Michelle, we're historically overdue, but also uh, they were just, in my opinion, too small to start with. Uh, 25 for a parking lot is just too small to start with. But that was my opinion. That's why we're bringing it to a full commission. <laughs> uh, I also want a smaller note. Uh, I said near the beginning, one of the major goals for this was to make it approachable to the public. It's a very small thing, but these are actual snapshots of the two tables. And you can see the one from 14 was a lot harder to read with no lines, et cetera. Uh, and um, so Leroy, I'm just gonna stop you before you jump ahead. There's one point I wanna make and Dave does have his hand raised. So I wanna make sure um, that we address whatever he's got. Um, the vernal pool protection is staying the same. The 100 foot no disturb around vernal pools. We just took it out of this table Leroy, would you mind just clicking on that table one more time just so I can see it? So um, this the, the header for this is type of project and vernal pools isn't a type of project. So that was removed out of there. There is a paragraph now underneath this table that explains the setback from vernal pools. So I just wanted to point that out. And the version I'm looking at, it's in there. Vernal pools and isolated vegetated wetlands. So Larry, I'm not sure what version you're looking at right now. Um, and, and actually, I did want to point out that um, this evening, the, I noticed that we're actually having a website issue with the links um, to these documents. So I'm going to correct that in the morning. Um, they have the links have been working for the last <laughs> month. <I swear>. But <laughs> of course, tonight, they're not working. And I'm like, why? Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know what versions you guys have, but I will I'll upload the full versions of all of these documents, the old version, the marked up version with track changes and the clean version into OneDrive so you have access to them. Um, so I'm not sure what version you have open, Larry, but I just wanted yep. to point that out. 
And I know Dave had a question. I don't wanna... Yeah, Dave, what's up? Yeah, no, just a quick one, Leroy. And that was going back to something Michelle said a minute ago. I think it would be helpful. Um, I believe Michelle referenced comparison to other towns. I always find that very helpful to know what other towns around us in the valley have for buffer zone for setbacks and no work areas. So, you know, I think it would be helpful for the public to maybe have that. We often do that, I know, um, with zoning, with um, even with our fee structure in Amherst. So um, I don't know, Michelle, if, if you can say more about that or if those if those uh, numbers are readily available or we could maybe put that in a table, I think it would be helpful. You know, here we have the comparison of 2014 to 22, but um, what, what do your proposed 22 um, uh, numbers look like compared to Hadley, South Hadley, you know, Northampton, et cetera? Yeah, and what I would suggest on that, Dave, I'll um, put a note next to that. And at the next hearing, I think um, maybe we could do some comparisons like that so that we yeah. could um, share some sort of more detailed, in-depth reasoning. Yeah, I just thought I'd put it out there. Yeah, it's always yeah. helpful to see what, what other communities are doing. And Michelle had referenced that we're still less than some other community, what, what other communities require. So. For comparison would be great. Thanks. A good point, Dave. I'm just trying to think about how I do that. I'm wondering if uh, I can make a table just like this, types of projects on the left in different towns at the top, and we could present that at the next meeting. That might make it pretty easy. Any other questions? Or anybody from the public for that matter? Because I can't see. Oh, now Sarah's ready. Oh, I'll mute you in one second. Hi. Hello. Um, so thank you first for all that hard work. Really appreciate it as an Amherst person. And um, that sounds like it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, and it's great to see the, the regulations being strengthened. Um, and I don't, on all the regulations, I mean, I would encourage you to keep a butter notifications on just because I know it may seem burdensome to people, but um, that's often the way that people find out about things. They're not always paying attention to what's going on. And um, so that's on that. And yeah, it would be really helpful to see that the table of comparisons again, yeah, I would be in favor of the, as personally as trying to be, you know, strict on that. Um, and the main comment that I wanted to have and that I spoke with Aaron, I was, you know, participated in the, <clears throat> that um, Eversource meetings and about the application of the pesticides and spoke with Aaron and she's the one who told me about this bylaw revision that was, I mean, the uh, regulation revision that was happening. Um, and what I just want to raise for you is, um, I would really like to see um, strengthened uh, restriction on the use of pesticides and herbicides, well, generally, but particularly in uh, wetlands resource areas, like the ones under the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. I know, and um, as a lawyer, I told this to Aaron, I work for a social mission law firm, um, and it's an area that, you know, we have interest in sort of looking into sort of helping um, communities who are interested in this, because it's it's a tricky area, obviously, as you guys are well aware in your position, there is a state uh, law that gives the um, Mass Department of, you know, MDAR the, um, the jurisdiction for um, deciding what pesticides can and can't be used. And so that is in the courts has been held to be preemptive in many situations. But I, I just want to let you know that um, there's a, a, case, a very helpful case that's quite recent out in Stockbridge, uh, Mass, where there was an application to uh, apply uh, aquatic herbicide to milfoil and the Stockbridge Concom um, 
decided they didn't want to allow that permit and the dis and then it got appealed um, and the judge actually did not uh, you know ruled in favor of the town on that preemption issue um, they actually it got remanded because the judge on the facts decided that the decision had that they hadn't applied the um, they hadn't done their job factually but on the preemption issue the town actually won. And so I just, I don't know, because I don't know you guys, you know, I, do, I don't know where you all stand with this, but um, I just want to put out there that it's something that I care, you know, very deeply about that we, that we try to minimize the use of, of these things. I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. And I'd be, you know, to the extent, I don't know whether there's a way that the public can be involved. You know, as I, as I said, you know, I think we're going to reach out to the Cape, the, some of the Cape towns are struggling with this. And um, there's a, uh, an organization out on the Cape that's trying to help towns figure out how to, um, you know, how to restrict herbicide and pesticide use in, in towns. And I, I just want to put it out there because it's something that, as I said, um, my firm is, you know, sort of working on and I'm willing to help with it and I urge you guys to, sorry, I've talked long enough. <laughs> uh, well, I definitely appreciate any offers of help, but we will keep that in mind. You're, uh, you had an original point about the button notifications. I want to be very clear that there was never any possibility of them going away. That's legal from the state from the start. What is interesting and new though, that I did forget to mention, is that the state requires only that the butters be notified that a project will occur and then how to find out more information about it. Um, we have added that uh, it is a requirement to add that information, the time and place of the meeting, as well as the description of the project. So our butter notifications have increased in, quantity, uh, in quality. Uh, and as far as quantity, they'll never decrease. That's, that's beyond us. Uh, as far as... Uh, future work with the town and your firm. Uh, you would have to talk to Aaron and Dave about that, but I know we are always accepting and happy of all help. <laughs> Any other public questions? Thank you. I cannot see. Looks like I know. Any uh, commissioner questions? Uh, I'm sorry. We we haven't really finished yet. Get the wrap up one. Mm -hmm. um, part five is almost entirely unchanged, right down to the word. Part six is unchanged. Uh, part six is important because as the amendments process, which is what we're actually currently doing, allows for revisions by commissioners. Um, Somebody has their hand up. Oh, who we got? Aaron and Dave, can you tell me who's got hands up? Because I can't see a participant. Janet, Janet Keller. Keller. Yes, I allowed her to talk, so she should be able to. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm in awe of the subcommittee, and I just want to say that um, so clearly. Uh, I attended two of your subcommittee meetings, and I was exhausted. Um, and you held, had all these meetings and all this work in between. And so um, just on the work, uh, the sheer amount of work and the challenges of that kind of work, I, I, um, I'm literally in awe. Um, and I'm terrifically excited about how you've modernized these um, regulations, brought them uh, uh, have them reflect the best practices from the mass wetlands law and the, the regs of the surrounding communities. Um, and I'm just really impressed by how you've strengthened things. I do have one request about the abutter um, notice and hope you will take a look at that section um, that gives uh, the uh, commission um, the right to grant waivers uh, of a butter notification requirements. Um, and uh, I hope that you will retain mail notification because um, 
notices in the, the newspapers are just um, not uh, the same. Um, they're, they're, um, it, if, if we want the public to know what's going on, um, that they, they have to get mail notifications. And there are so many reasons why we want that. They're, they're right next to the resources. They see it every day of the year. They have um, really important information um, to contribute. And um, I, I do hope you will um, work on, I, I hope you will look at section D two and three and um, come to a different conclusion than uh, you have recently. Um, I'm interested to see where you end up on the chemicals, but I haven't studied it. Um, it they do make me ner very nervous. And I know some, you know, that um, they can be applied. They're, they're often applied on very big swaths um, along railroads and electrical lines and roads and stuff. So. Um, I think that's very important to look into. And um, once again, congratulations on a just superb piece of work. Thanks. Thank you for those very kind words, Jenny. Roy, would it be okay if I field the abutter question? I just want to clarify that. I think I need some clarification. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me just let me just clarify so that everybody's everybody's crystal clear. Okay, so under this under state law, if somebody files a notice of intent, they have to notify abutters. All of those not uh, butter notifications are required, and our by our bylaw regulations are now consistent with what the state requires, which it wasn't before. Under a notice of intent, there is no waiving of any um, a butter notification requirements. Okay, you you cannot waive a notice of intent um, requirement for a butter notices. Under state law, for a request for determination, there, they, the state does not require a public hearing. The state requires a public meeting. So what that means is that a legal ad is posted for a request for determination, but that abutters aren't required to be notified under state law, State Well and Protection Act. Our bylaw does require abutter notification requirements for an RDA. So our our bylaw regulations are more strict than the state. That provision that Janet is referencing is for the commission to, in spe very specific cases, use their discretion in waiving the abutter notification requirements for an RDA application. And the reason that that was added in specifically was because you guys may re recall the railroad filing for their um, five-year operation and maintenance plan. They filed an RDA for that plan. And in the course of filing, they asked for a waiver of the town's abutter notification requirements. And the commission granted that waiver. However, we didn't have anything in our bylaw that allowed us to grant that waiver. So because the, there had been a precedent of the commission allowing the granting of that waiver, that's why we added that in was to give the commission that flexibility. Um, now hindsight is 2020, and what <laughs> what we've discovered was, um, you know, it's it's been a little bit of a rough road with the railroad for for a variety of reasons. Um, but I just wanted to point that out for context here is that we are more strict than the state as far as what we require with abutter notification requirements, and that. Um, was added in there because of a, a historic precedent that the commission had required. Now, um, my personal feeling on it was, um, I didn't really see any reason why the railroad shouldn't be required to notify abutters when other entities like Eversource notify abutters all the time for their line work. Um, but it's at the discretion of the commission. So just for the full discussion of this, I think that's just an important piece of context. And Aaron, the notifications are by mail, is that right? 
Yes. Yep. And, right it's, now. and it's and it's mm -hmm. and it's certified. So either return receipt, the little green return receipt card, or certificate of mailing, which is basically a receipt that the post office stamps certifying that a letter has been mailed to that individual. So that's what's required um, for the abutter notifications under our, our bylaw. And just because this this has come up a couple times, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. And if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to answer. But I think it's uh, an important thing for the commission to consider that specific sort of subsection of allowing that waiver and whether it's something that they want to continue doing in the future or not. I think Sarah has another question. Uh, absolutely. Hi, so I'm a, I'm in the red line, which is, am I just wrong? And I'm just in the red line that I pulled off the um, town website and under request for determination of applicability, there seems to be a provision that allows anybody to request a waiver for a butter notifications on a case by case basis. Anybody may request one on a case by case basis. It is entirely unlikely that we would give everyone one. But is that new? That was added in, yes. Right. So I I pretty strongly think that's not a good I that's just my opinion. I don't think waivers should be granted. And so I don't actually think the commission should have the authority. To grant waivers, I would I would urge you not to make that change, just because it's one more thing that you then have to monitor. I mean, as a member of the public, it's really really hard to keep on top of things, and so that's why it's helpful to have laws and bylaws and regulations that pretty much do what you're hoping is going to be done, and have you know sort of limit the discretion things and what I'm, and I understand in some context, it's, you've got to have discretion, but the abutter notification, it's just, it's just an absolutely critical way that people find out about things. And as the person who was talking mentioned, you know, it's the, the, the abutters are the ones who are most affected by someone and are the most likely to want to participate in anything that has to do with something that's going on near them because they're directly impacted. So I, I would just urge you not to make that change and make, and just always require a button notification. Can I just make a comment to revisit this, guys? Um, so Aaron, you mentioned that the railroad seems to have like a certain exempt, like a de facto exemption from this, whereas Eversource generally does, you know, notify abutters that you said? Right. Um, I can uh, just to keep going with the thought, like, yeah, go I, I mean, I, I can think of places where the railroad goes pretty near homes. So I don't know like how long of a stretch one of their RDAs would account for, but like if we were considering it and it went through some homes. I mean, is that an example of when you would say you do have to notify abutters? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of things. The first is if if the commission feels this is a controversial item to add to our, our bylaw regs, there is no problem with us taking it out. And at this point in time, I would be completely comfortable with that. So unless anybody has an objection to it, um, that's just something to put out there. Um, I don't want there to be any sort of like sticking points of controversy that would um, hold us from approving this, something simple that we can take out that would make everyone happy, I think is fine. Um, the railroad versus Eversource is a tough comparison. So the reason that the railroad had to file was because they file what are called um, yearly operational management plans where they spray um, and they do a foliar spray along the entire extent of their entire right of way going from 
Belchertown all the way to Leverett. And they are required to submit plans to us that show where sensitive areas are and where no spray zones are going to be. So the reason that they filed that RDA was basically for us to approve or disapprove of their no spray zones. Um, would I have liked to have seen a Notice of Intent application for that? Absolutely. Um, does the state standard allow them to file an RDA for it? They do. And um, we're one of the more strict towns that does require a butter notices in our regs, but we did grant a waiver. Now we were one of three towns that denied those spray permits to the railroad because their plans were inadequate. Um, and they're supposed to be coming back before us, but if the railroad was ever replacing a culvert or something like that, they would still need to file um, a full application, um, just like Eversource does and has many times over. So, um, like I said, I think if if um, the issue with the butter notifications is a sticking point that people feel strongly about, I think we should remove that provision if nobody on the commission objects to it. Um, the other thing is, and I, what I would like to do is um, for the next round, which I think we should probably start to think about wrapping up this hearing because we do have um, another business item after this hearing tonight. But I just wanted to um, point out that at the next hearing, what I'd like to do is to specifically call out a couple areas where questions had been raised. So like the, the area of um, with questions around herbicide applications. So I can actually call out that specific section and say what we've done around that issue. Um, if the commission wants to remove the provision about the, the um, waiver for um, a butter notices, we can talk about that. And then um, comparing what other towns have done. I would also be opening open to doing sort of a a quick sort of flip through of the bylaw to show some of the examples of of the quick PowerPoint overview that Leroy did, just to provide um, a little more um, in depth look at what the changes are, uh, sort of from a public forum standpoint. So I just wanted to point out those things. All right. Um... I see Sarah's going to comment, but unfortunately, I have Janet before you. So hold on just one moment. Um, Janet, you should be able to speak now. Just want to say that um, I would be a lot more comfortable if it comes out. And, um, and to ask, when is the next hearing in two weeks? I yes. I it is, yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. And it sounds like Janet so far it does sound like we're leaning toward taking that up. We shall see. Uh, another comment from Sarah. You should be able to speak now. Hi. Yeah, I was just gonna. Um, yeah, I, uh, so obviously I'd like to see it come out, but I mean, I just know Aaron works, you know, so hard, and that that sounds like it was a really frustrating experience. Um, with the railroad. And so I just wanted to make the point that, you know, one positive side for, I mean, one positive side for not allowing the waiver is that then it doesn't put the commission in this awkward position of having them to decide what they're going to do. It's sort of decided for you. And it's a little bit protective of the commission in the sense that if there's something that something like the railroads doing and people are gonna get upset about it, it, it's not just all on the commission to have to carry that weight of, well, how is the town gonna to feel about that? You're gonna have you know, town people who are affected that are, so I don't know, I just, I just think it can be you know, helpful for the, the town and it's not just, you know, you're not just left with sort of Aaron having to battle these people who are not you know, behaving particularly well. <laughs> you sort of have some support. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. So is this, uh, is this something that uh, we're going to be uh, looking to discuss in the future? Or is this something that uh, we should be discussing, uh, kind of developing the discussion uh, further today? Um, to my ear, it sounds like 
all three of these things that Aaron just mentioned will be discussed at the next meeting in detail future, but it does sound like we're building consensus toward pulling that out, but mm -hmm. it won't be moved on tonight for sure. Yeah. 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 As, uh, more than anything, I'm uh, curious. I mean, I, I suppose, Aaron, uh, what you said earlier was the actual reasons why the exemption was, uh, was granted. Uh, is essentially because it's uh, it was too big of a project to for them to uh, notify everybody, or is that that's what it was? Right. I mean, they would have been notifying, um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of people for their yearly operation maintenance for the train track, um, and and they felt like that was. Um, a burdensome request for the town to put on them just for their <clears throat> annual maintenance. <clears throat> and other towns don't require it. And so that's why Amherst is unique because we do require a butter notices for RDA applications. Not all towns do, most towns do not. Mm. I, I, uh, I guess um, I wanted to leave, uh, leave it my comments open, but I would, uh, um, I think I'd fee if uh, if I were to uh, tend toward having toward allowing uh, or toward uh, tend toward having such um, exemptions, I think it would be helpful to have those uh, have the types of exemptions that we would be considering um, listed out, defined. Um, in order to not uh, be getting requests for uh, exemptions from all different sides so that um, uh, it's not, it doesn't have any kind of appearance of uh, being arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Andre. Like, if it was going to stay in there, there'd have to be some sort of a um, a really solid logical reason why the commission would be granting it. Um, yeah. Like, for example, like under the Wetlands Protection Act, I think there's like for, you know, financial hardship reasons or things like that that um, are called out specifically. But um, I think I think we should put some more thought to that. Why don't we all think about it some more and um, come to the next discussion ready to look at that a little bit more solidly in terms of is it, is it going to get swiped? Are we going to add some provisions in there for specific examples of when the commission could or could not um, issue those? Um, no, I totally agree. Yeah, but I, I, I agree with all the comments. I think, I think everybody's made some great points. Um, so uh, it's, uh, looking like no more public comments or hands raised um aaron says we do have one more business item to get to so we should wrap this up pretty soon yeah i do have to put out the thank yous though one to kp law who is our town attorney they did a lot of review one to michelle for the research and edits she made and one to Aaron for a lot of things, including the inception of this project. Like I said, it's been on the back burner since 2018, 19. Uh, it was her idea to revisit it now and start the process, come up with a schedule. Um, and so she is the biggest one to thank in all of this. And that is that. So what is our next business, Aaron? Or do we have to close um, the hearing somehow? Yeah, so just and just for public who are in attendance, let's uh, just kind of give a broader overview of what the plan is here, which is that um, we are going to be continuing this hearing for the bylaw to um, the uh, June 8th Conservation Commission meeting, and then again to the June 22nd Conservation Commission meeting. The idea being to tease apart some of the things that we've discussed tonight, give some examples, um, talk more detail and also give the public more opportunity to comment. So um, at the next meeting, I'll sort of delve into some of the, the things that have been highlighted here. Um, maybe we can, depending on how much time we have, obviously we'll 
we'll take public comment as much as possible and then we could potentially flip through the document a little bit and see where the changes have been made. Um, so what we would need basically is a, um, a motion to continue the public hearing for um, the bylaw regulation amendments to the June 8th meeting at 7.35 p.m. All move. <laughs> Second. Uh, moved by Larry, seconded by Michelle. Voice vote, Larry? Aye. Andre? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm not. So, Leroy, do you want to um, stop sharing your screen? And um, what we have on the agenda for discussion, um, and I'm sorry because I lost my remote computer. I've got to log back in. But um, Pete Wilson had requested to come before the Conservation Commission this evening. Um, so he is here and we can pull him in. I'm just getting logged back in so I can open our PowerPoint. So um, I don't know if Pete has anybody here with him. I'm going to allow Pete to talk. Um, I just um, before we get into sort of like the nitty gritty of what Pete is requesting, I'd like to just have a chance to kind of go over from a regulatory standpoint what the options are so that we can help Pete along. So I'm gonna allow Pete to talk. And I don't know if anybody else is here with Pete or if it's just Pete on behalf of himself. Hi, good evening. Hello. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, no, Ward was going to join us, but it's my understanding that the board's not going to work with us on an extension. Um, so Ward's going to take up the, uh, the new uh, application. Uh, but the reason I wanted to still get in here was um, to find out where we stand with the cease and desist order. I raised that question back in March as we provided the last uh, piece we believe uh, to the commission and just want to have an update on where that's at. So um, Pete, from my perspective, your site is in compliance right now. Um, you've done everything that we've asked as far as um, addressing the violation out on the site. Um, I, I guess I, I I'm going to just share my screen because this might make this discussion a little bit easier. Um, so, um, Pete had asked to be on the hearing tonight because, or to be on the meeting tonight, because it's a little bit of a conflict, a com complicated situation. Um, uh, Pete owns a piece of property which has an order of conditions that has been in place and approved. Um, it's a, an order of conditions that governs a subdivision. So there was actually three lots that were subject to the original order of conditions. One of the lots had, has or had already been built completely. There's a single family house lot there. The other two lots had remained undeveloped. In 2019, when I started, the order of conditions was coming up on its expiration. And um, there was a request for an extension that came in for the order of conditions. And um, when I went out to do an inspection, I had seen that there was a violation on the property. There had been work done there without um, a pre-construction meeting um, and work had been done beyond the boundaries of what had been approved in the original order of conditions. So the commission had taken enforcement action um, 
and in the form of a cease and desist and basically asked for the flags to be rehung by survey for the wet um, the flags to be rehung by survey to determine the extent of the impact of the violation and then once we got out there for that site visit it became clear that the wetlands had expanded and so the commission had asked for um, the wetlands to be reflagged according to the current condition of the wetland on the site. Um, this was during all during the pandemic that this occurred and um, the governor did a, um, a permit tolling period. So basically it, it allowed um, all permits to have an automatic permit extension. And so in June, this permit is coming up for um, uh, expiration. So it's gonna be expiring the, the, the um, approved permit. And so um, the, the questions that we had been discussing, Pete and I over email, and I also talked with Tom Reedy about, which had sort of been an, an, a larger overarching question is how to handle this order, existing order of conditions. Um, for example, when you issue an extension, usually the, it's just a clean extension of the permit. The work is underway and they need a little additional time to get the work done. In this case, there were some documented changes that occurred to the property, um, which make extending the permit difficult because if you, if you extend a permit, you're basically saying that the permit is still valid, nothing has changed on the site. So the question then became, do we need a formal amendment or a minor amendment? And it seems as though there have been significant changes on the site where the violation occurred. And also based on some reflagging, um, it appears that there may also be some resource or changes on the other undeveloped lot, which made me lean more toward a, a formal amendment process or a new permit filing. Um, and that still doesn't deal with the extension of the permit. So in just in all discussions, it seems like a new notice of intent would be the cleanest, quickest, easiest way for um, Pete to move forward with um, getting a single family house lot on the single lot he wanted to build on. Um, he had talked about getting an extension just for the single lot, but unfortunately that's not really how the orders of condition work. Whatever's approved in the original permit includes everything in the original permit. So we can't issue an extension just for one house lot. It would be for the entire permit. Um, so I know that's a lot of background. Um, I, I don't want to give the impression of an unwillingness to work with Pete on an extension. Um, I think that from the regulatory standpoint, it's very tricky because site conditions have changed and those site conditions have required sort of a redesign of the approved plan. So it's it's gotten into like sort of more significant changes than the original permit. Um, so anyways, that's just sort of some historic background on the situation. Um, but it's been it's been an, the permit has been at an impasse since the violation occurred. And so um, that's where things stand. And I believe the permit is due to expire in early June. I think you make a good case for a new notice of intent, Erin, given the substantial changes to the work in the resource area and then the moving forward. Um, that's just my chime in, commissioners. And additionally, the fact that uh, you can't just uh, change change a half of it. That's where I'm at. Um, Peter, is there any disagreement from your end? Did you say that you're already working toward new permit with Ward Smith? Well, we've been we've been working with Ward. I mean, I'll be very candid. Uh, it doesn't really matter what I think. Um, I'm. My two cents is we've been working good faith with the board since March 13th when we got that uh, revision of plan. You know, we've been affected by COVID as well. And, you know, I just look at the time that has passed and I've, um, I, I, you know, I, 
I believe everyone had good intentions. Um, I wish, you know, I, I, I wanted Ward tonight, but after his conversation with Aaron today, he, he felt like, you know, there was no way working an extension. So he said, let's just cave in and do what the board really wants. But, you know, I, I it, with all due respect, I sit here and say, what has the last three months really uh, accomplished? And that's why tonight I just felt like, you know, okay, I'll take Ward's best, best judgment. Uh, we'll file and, and do that. We should have done that back in March. But the bigger, the larger question is the cease and desist, the cease and desist order, I believe is still in place. I'd like to see that removed. If everyone agrees we're done. So then the slate's clean. We've paid our debt. Uh, Ward can get on with the new notice of intent and, you know, we will uh, put the other matter behind us and move forward. I very much appreciate that. Um, Aaron seems to think it's in full compliance. I see no reason to disagree. Aaron, is there anything we would have to do to formally release him from the cease and desist? I mean, we could issue a correspondence that basically says um, everything that we've requested to be done um, to remediate the situation has been resolved. Um, and I think that that would, that would be fine. I think that the big question for me becomes there's there is a active order of conditions for two lots until the beginning of June and it is um, May 25th so I don't think I don't think that you know and obviously there are requirements of the order that um, like a pre construction meeting and things like that so it's not as if they could just go out to the site and start doing work on the permit before it expires. Um, so yeah, I don't, um, I think that there's, there's sort of two steps we could issue um, the, a more formal letter that basically states we're lifting the cease and desist order. And then I think um, with the new permit filing, the question or the out, only other outstanding issue is what to do with that. Um, outstanding order of conditions that's, requ that's recorded on the deed and um, how to sort of get that off of there so that the new order could come through. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process to request a certificate of compliance. Um, and so that would also release the, that permit from those lots so that you could move, move forward with a new filing. All right. I'm sure Ward's got similar information for you, but from what I'm hearing, uh, you will have to file for a certificate of compliance on this current permit to close it out before you issue the new permit. Um, also, what I'm hearing is we are all happy to issue a formal letter saying that you're in compliance now, uh, if that will do anything for you, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, no, I, I just think that we have to clear up the other unless I'm misinformed, but Ward did say we, we had to clean up the uh, the other uh, cease and desist. So I'm I'm uh, uh, happy with that. And I'll I think Ward is traveling. Unfortunately, there was a funeral he's got to attend. So I mean he's going to get after it as soon as he gets a chance. I'll remind him about the uh, about the existing conditions. Yeah, and, and Pete, we'll absolutely work with you on a new permit filing out there to, to help you move it move it along quickly as quickly quickly as we can. Um, because you know you've been very cooperative and we really appreciate that. And and you know, it's not a matter of trying to hold up the permit. It's really just a matter of um, administratively there's sort of a break in normal process here. And so we're just trying to see that through smoothly so that everybody can move forward. I understand, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the letter you will write, Aaron, is there anything we need to vote on for that? We have to vote that he's in compliance for a certain if if you if somebody wants to make a motion, that's fine. Um, but I, um, he's he's done everything we've asked, so I don't really see any reason right. why we couldn't just state he's in compliance. Yeah, Mr. Wilson, it sounds like you're all set. Thank you very much for taking some time. Come okay, on. thank you. We'll see you in the future. Bye now. Bye bye. Good night.
I do not have an agenda in front of me, Aaron. Is there oh, that's more? okay. Um, so I guess the, the only outstanding issue is that we had an executive session scheduled um, this evening for Zero Tuckerman, but um, there's really um, not much to provide by way of update, but at the next meeting there may be. So I would just recommend that um, the commission state for the June 8th meeting um, that somebody might want to make a motion um, that we schedule the executive session for Zero Tuckerman, just so that it's like a placeholder in case we have an update at that meeting. Yep, I'll make the motion <clears throat> to schedule um, the executive session uh, pursuant to GL uh, section 30A, no, no, I don't know what C means, C30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body executive session to be held, what's the day? Uh, June 8th, 2020. Second. Uh, voice vote, Andre. Aye. Hey, Laura. Aye. Uh, Laura, I mean, Fletcher, sorry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I for me. And just to be clear, that's for Zero Tuckerman. Um, I just want to make sure I state that mm. clearly on the record that that's for Zero Tuckerman for that discussion. Other than that, I have no more business for you this evening. I'm so glad we were able to carve out a good chunk of time to talk about the bylaw. <laughs> and, um, we'll continue the, that discussion at the next meeting. Yeah, great job, you guys. That's a, yeah. That was, that was a, such a heavy lift. That's really that's impressive. A big one. Yeah, totally. Yep, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for and presenting you're gonna, you're all gonna this. You're going to have a link up, link up there, Aaron, so we can get at it. Yes, I'll I'll fix the links first thing tomorrow, and well, they're um, actually working now. But are they the correct ones? Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what is going on with the website. I tried to message Brianna at the end of the day today, and I didn't get her. But I'll make sure that we take care of that in the morning. Yeah, I was trying to find it while we were talking uh, earlier, and it kept on saying "oops, oops." Or yes, oops. I got the "oops" too. All the active interest. <laughs> I did pull them into the OneDrive as well. Should we wanted. close this meeting, Aaron, and stop recording? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of you have to make a motion to adjourn. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn yeah, at 9.09. <laughs> Seconded. Uh, voice for Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Mara. Aye. Andre. Aye. So moved. All right. Thank you guys so much. Nice job, everyone. See you in a couple weeks. Thank Thank you. Have a good, good evening. Bye.